It was said that in a little German village, during the 30s, people had their own idea of what National Socialism was. Nazism, they thought, had something to do with purity. Indeed, they even believed its most important feature to be sexual denial. And when the old women talked of this stringent demand, they would shake their troubled heads and say, this National Socialism is a tough one. It's only the teacher who might manage it, or maybe the barber. Even though the villagers had their own idea about Nazism, they nevertheless touched on something important. Nazism's dream of creating, through purity and sacrifice, a more beautiful world. The Nazi gospel warns of a world about to collapse, an eternal twilight that threatens to engulf the earth. The Nazis claim to have discovered the source of this threat and took it upon themselves to eradicate it. Purified and preserved from decay, a new Germany would arise, mightier and more beautiful than ever before. Germany celebrates German Arts Day in Munich, 1939. It is the Third Reich's last major art exhibit. Within six weeks, the Second World War would commence. Yes, this government, half of which consists of men who once aspired to serve the arts, is conscious of the artist's role as an intermediary declares Hans Frederick Munk, author and president of the Reich's Chamber of Literature. He continues, this government, born out of the opposition to rationalism, knows the people's inner longings, their boundless dreams, to which only the artist can give form. Though this claim may be hyperbole, it is not entirely groundless. Failed artists were characteristic of the leadership of the Third Reich. Several of the men nearest Hitler had made serious artistic endeavors. Goebbels, for one, who had written a novel as well as poetry and plays. Or Rosenberg, the party ideologist who had dabbled in painting and entertained literary ambitions. Or von Schirach, Hitler's youth leader, who was considered one of the Reich's foremost poets. And Hitler himself, a failed painter who dreamt of being an architect. He never abandoned the dream. His artistic efforts extended into the 1920s. Pedantically drawn watercolors in the style of postcards. Oh, how I'd love to stay here working with art, he declares from his retreat shortly before war breaks out. He's an artist, not a politician. And as soon as the war is over, he will retire and devote himself to art. At 18, Hitler had unsuccessfully applied to the Academy of Art in Vienna. Refusal was a hard blow, but he hid his disappointment. Instead of returning to his home in Linz, he remained in Vienna. He drifts around Vienna, goes to the opera, paints a little, 
Occasionally, he devotes himself to some far-fetched artistic project. He and his childhood friend, August Kubitschek, make an amateurish effort based on an idea that Richard Wagner abandoned to write an opera together. Three years earlier, he and Kubitschek have had a decisive opera experience. And at the theater in Linz, they have seen Wagner's opera, Rienzi. The opera is set in medieval Rome. Rienzi, the people's spokesman, rises against the aristocracy. He wants to turn the clock back 15 centuries and re-establish the Roman Republic of Antiquity. In that spirit, he lets himself be made tribune of the people. But Rienzi falls victim to a conspiracy. He fights his last battle in the capital as it crashes, burning around him. Hitler is deeply moved by Rienzi. Overwhelmed, he outlines for Kubitschek his plans for his own future and that of his people. Later, he would say, it was in that hour it all began. This experience cemented three fixations in Hitler that would never lose their grip on him. His fixations on Linz, his home city, on antiquity, and on Wagner. Whoever would understand Nazism must first know Wagner, said Hitler. And indeed, Wagner occupied a special place in Hitler's imagination. Wagner's political tracks were early favorites of Hitler's. Already in Linz, he had fantasized over his own operas. So extravagant as to eclipse Wagner's works. It was opera's scenic possibilities that fascinated Hitler. The fantastic illusion, the flight from reality. In Wagner, he saw his idol, creative artist and politician in one person. Hitler borrowed Wagner's props, anti-Semitism, the cult of a Nordic legacy, the myth of pure blood, all gave counter to Hitler's worldview. From Wagner, too, came the notions of art as the basis of a new civilization. And the artist prince, risen from the people, who would unite life and art to herald the advent of the new state. Hitler found use for his artistic bent in political work. He created Nazi props, everything, from uniforms to flags and standards. With his own sketches and instructions, he gave the Nazi movement its form. Hitler's 1923 sketch of the party standard. The goldsmith Gar prepares from Hitler's sketches the first standard of the NSDAP. Propaganda provided the outlet for Hitler's artistic ambitions. The Nazi mass rallies were quasi-art of gigantic proportions, with Hitler as set designer, director, and leading actor. rallies also embodied a central Nazi ideal, the myth of the body of the German folk. This myth, 
the people, the masses, seen as one body with its own circulatory system, would become a basic element in the Nazi vision of racial purification. of January 1933. The Nazis celebrate Hitler's seizure of power. Feverish activity is begun to quickly gain control over every level of German society. Everywhere Nazi activists force their way in. A proclamation is made in March. What German artists expect of the new government. The paper's source is a coalition of Nazi cultural groups. Their program demands that Bolshevik unart and unculture be destroyed, and they offer at the same time to stand like seasoned soldiers in the vanguard of the struggle. They also demand that all purged works be shown publicly and then burnt as a warning to all. In 1933, a wave of exhibitions of so-called degenerate art washes over Germany, Mannheim, Nuremberg, Dessau, Stuttgart, Dresden, Already in the early 20s, art was of first-rank importance to the Nazis. Cultural degeneration was seen by many as a genuine threat. Decay was a modish word among the German petty bourgeoisie. Behind the calamities that had plagued Germany, cultural Bolshevism in particular, the Jew was felt to be the instigator, the ringleader. with its skewed perspectives of avant-garde art, was to the Nazi an augury of impending doom. To them, the chaos they perceived in it was visible evidence of spiritual and intellectual depravity. In 1928, under the leadership of Rosenberg, the first Nazi cultural organization was founded. The National Socialist Society for German Culture. One of the six founders is SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Later, the society renames itself the Defense Guild for German Culture. The offensive against modern art soon took on a hygienic character. Modern artists' works were said to show signs of mental illness. Their creators were ripe for the madhouse. One of the Defense Guild's most influential members, art theorist Paul Schultz Domberg, begins a nationwide speaking tour in January 1931. In the world of German art, a struggle to the death rages, not unlike the struggle in politics. And it must be fought with the same gravity and singleness of mind, he says. Showing lantern slides to illustrate the lectures, he projects his vision of art hygiene. By choosing pictures of deformed cases from medical journals, and comparing them with modern art, he claims to show a link between physical degeneration and artistic perversion.
The pictures and diagnoses are supplied to him by Dr. Weigand of Hamburg University Psychiatric Clinic. In Schultz Naumberg's view, art is not only a mirror of racial health. Here he refers to antiquity and the Renaissance, but has as its duty, even as the Grecian marbles did, to be a representative expression of the people's longing for racial fulfillment. On seeing these pictures, no one can identify them with anything but the misshapen wretches in clinics and madhouses, where the blighted and degenerate of our species are gathered, concludes Schultz Naumberg. No spiritually healthy person needs to be convinced that an outlook is revealed here, which must be forever banished from the new Germany. On July 14, 1933, a new law is enacted. This Gesetz soll helfer sein, das Kranke auszumerzen. Ebenso wichtig ist es, das Gesunde und Starke zu fördern. It permits mandatory sterilization of the insane, the asocial and the hereditarily tainted. But this law is only the first step in an ongoing process. In March 1935, an exhibition opens in Berlin, The Miracle of Life, here, the physician emerges as the spearhead of Nazi racial policy. In the quest for pure blood, the enemies are the Jew, race mixing, and degeneration. In a special section, Schultz Naumberg's comparisons turn up. Another section is devoted to the mentally ill and asocial. A grisly vision is conjured up of idiots and retards gradually outnumbering normal people. Still other sections deal with race, preservation, and refinement. Our first principle of beauty is health, Hitler declares. The methods of medical science will ensure that end. With the physician as esthetician, aesthetic problems became medical ones. This exhibition already defines the presumptions underlying mass murder. No longer does the physician minister to the individual. Now he is the healer of the corpus of the race, a biological warrior fighting diseased and inferior elements that threaten the body of the German folk. Now the physician in uniform comes to the fore of society. The Nazification of physicians began in the first months of Nazi rule, as Jewish doctors were stripped of their positions. This mass expulsion created undreamt of career possibilities. Physicians with the right ideology quickly soared to the top. Special schools offered courses in Nazi medicine. No other profession could boast so many party members. 45% of German physicians belonged to the party. Mein Kampf clearly states the goal of Nazism's biomedical pioneers, a state which preserves in a time of pollution its finest racial elements, must one day be lord of the earth. 
Our followers must never forget this when they compare the sacrifices to the envisioned results. Gerhard Wagner, the Third Reich's chief doctor, promises that in the future, too, we shall fulfill our mission according to the Führer's will, to create the new German man. At the National Party rally in 1935, Hitler tells Wagner his intention, to have the incurably ill liquidated. Was wir uns unter der deutschen Jugend der Zukunft wünschen, ist etwas anderes, als was die Vergangenheit sich gewünscht hat. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen nennen, auf das unser Volk nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit runde geht. During this rally, new laws are made public, which Gerhard Wagner lauds in his speech as the law that will protect German blood, the Nuremberg Laws. Marriage between Germans and Jews is outlawed. In 1936, Wagner discusses with other high-ranking party men and doctors the possibility of making a film. At the film's premiere in Berlin, 1937, Dr. Wagner gives the welcoming speech. The film will be shown in every cinema in Germany. Das Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. Erdgesunde Menschen wohnten in engen, lichtlosen Gassen und halb verfallenen Lauben. Idioten und Schwachsinnigen baute man aber Paläste und diese kranken Menschen waren gar nicht empfänglich für die Schönheit, mit der man sie umgab. Das deutsche Volk kennt das ganze Ausmaß dieses Elends wohl kaum. Es kennt nicht den drückenden Geist jener Häuser, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. In den letzten 70 Jahren hat sich unser Volk um 50 Prozent vermehrt, während die Zahl der Erbkranken im gleichen Zeitraum um 450 Prozent gestiegen ist. Wenn diese Entwicklung so weiterliefe, würde schon in 50 Jahren auf vier gesunde Menschen ein Erbkranker kommen. Ein endloser Zug des Grauens würde in die Nation hineinmarschieren, maßloses Elend über ein wertvolles Volk kommen, das dann mit Riesenschritten seinem Ende entgegenginge. Das Gesetz zur Verhütung erbkranken... Beautification of the world was one of the tenets of Nazi ideology. Once long ago the world was beautiful, but race mixing and degeneration had polluted it. Only a return to earlier ideals could make mankind flourish again. In the early 30s, Hitler began putting together an art collection. This private gallery gives an inkling of his world view and the ideals he sought to reestablish. The collection is dominated by art from the Bismarck era. Works by Hans Markart. 
Franz de Frager, Rudolf Epp, Franz von Stuck, Perhaps the collection was meant for the museum Hitler dreamt of founding in Linz, a museum for which he would choose the objet d'art, and where he alone would decide what great art was. The collection reveals how limited Hitler's intellectual world was. Among the 74 works included are a few portraits, all of them painted from photographs. One of Hitler's mother, one of his father, two of his niece, Geli Raubel, the only woman Hitler was ever close to, a suicide in 1931. One of his deceased chauffeur, Julius Schreck, and one of Richard Wagner. As museum founder, Hitler would create the Reich's first great art event. P. L. Trust, architect and Hitler's confidant, had been commissioned in 1933 to build a new museum in Munich. In October, Hitler lays the foundation stone. Even before the museum is completed, the first exhibit is in preparation. A jury made up of experts whom Hitler trusts are to make selections from the 15,000 works submitted. Six weeks before the museum's opening, Hitler inspects the results. Disappointed, exasperated, he takes over the job himself. Heinrich Hoffmann, his photographer and well-versed in Hitler's taste, is assigned to model the exhibit after Hitler's intentions. On July 18, 1937, the House of German Art and the Great German Art Exhibit are unveiled. It is a showing of the new genuine German art. Sculptor is given great precedence. Sculptors such as Brecker and Thorak launched the style that is to be typical of the Nazi era. But Hitler's inauguration speech is not about art alone. This exhibit represents the end of lunacy in art and the denial of the German people's culture. Henceforth, we shall wage a relentless purgative war against the rear guard of our culture's disintegration. A flyer comes with a catalog. To put the renaissance of German art into proper perspective, the exhibition Degenerate Art is opened the next day. With Goebbels' help, Hitler had already made sure of the exhibition's success. The degenerate art show would put an end to Jewish art Bolshevism. The works of some 730 banned artists were shown. Oscar Kokoschka, Emil Nolde, Franz Mark, Max Beckmann, 
Yankel Adler, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. German art had now undergone its purifying bath, but Nazism's ambition to beautify included every area of life. It even found administrative expression in the Bureau of Beauty of Labor. Wir hatten uns schon daran gewöhnt, dass unsere Arbeitsstätten, die Fabriken und Berghöfe hässlich und schmutzig aussehen. Das wird nun anders. Unsere Arbeitsstätten sollen schön und würdig werden. Es geht hier nicht um Äußerlichkeiten. Der Betriebsführer muss erkennen, dass noch wichtiger als die Maschinen die Menschen in seinem Betriebe sind. Es geht um ein neues, starkes Lebensgefühl. Es geht um die Freude an der Arbeit für den schaffenden deutschen Menschen. Cleanliness was the gospel of beauty of labor. Clean workers in tidy workshops was its slogan. Beauty of labor meant liberation of the workers through cleanliness. Chief physician Gerhard Wagner expressed it simply. If class struggles to die out, work and with it creativity must first be freed from the stigma of dirt. <laughs> Thus, if one shows the worker how to wash properly, thereby raising him to a bourgeois level, he will soon realize that he has nothing to fight for. The worker's aesthetic awakening would not only free him from his class, but free society from the abrasive conflicts caused by class struggle. The society would be the embodiment of an ideal, cleansed from all ugliness, untouched by chaos and filth. It's people, handsome and healthy, striving for a common goal. To characterize this new epoch, new buildings must be erected. Already on the evening when he seized power, Hitler talked about his architectural plans. Hitler called the Chancellery a piddling cigar box, and architect Albert Speer's first major task was to create a new Chancellery building worthy of the new state. Hitler has made the first sketches himself. The project is kept secret. Until war breaks out, Hitler devotes much of his time to the architecture of the new Germany. He heaps new sketches over Speer. And between their meetings, he painstakingly works on new ideas. The volume of this architectural vision is gargantuan. More than 40 cities are in line for monumental building projects. Zum Neubau des Hauses, des Fremdenverkehrs in Berlin und befehle damit zugleich der Beginn der Arbeit des Umbaus von Groß-Berlin. On June 14, 1938, Hitler proclaims a sweeping new design for Berlin. Und größeren Berlin, das neue und größere Deutschland einer glücklichen, 
geschichtlichen Zukunft entgegenzuführen. However, the actual scope of his outsized plans for the capital city is kept secret. On the new chancellery's completion in January 1939, a myth is minted. According to the myth, Hitler has commissioned Speer only one year earlier to design and build the massive structure. In fact, the actual work had begun four years before. At about the same time he sketched plans for the new chancellery, Hitler decided to rebuild his chalet in Berchtesgarten to have it befit his new status. To this end, he not only produced sketches, but completely took over the replanning of Berghof, his retreat. The original house was to be part of the new structure. The result was amateurish. Obvious weaknesses flaw the design. An alpine chalet aspiring to be a chateau. Hitler's pride was a retractable window, the world's biggest, with an area of 32 square meters. At Berghof, the monumental is paired with the petty bourgeois in a bizarre way. The world's biggest retractable window is still a chalet window after all. A bourgeois dream, absurdly inflated. The window on the landscape, like the glass over a painting, embodied Hitler's aesthetic ideal. Mountain landscapes were among his favorite motifs. At the great German art exhibit in 1938, Hitler buys not only Zugspitz Massive by Franz Bernhardt, but nine other paintings of Alpine scenes. For the yearly exhibitions in the House of German Arts, Hitler's photographer Heinrich Hoffmann is now the one-man jury. On the day of the 1938 opening, Hitler rewards Hoffmann with a professorship. Hitler himself buys 372 works, one-third of the entire exhibition. die nationalsozialistische Bewegung nach langjährigem Kampf endlich mit der Führung des Reiches betraut wurde. Sind noch nicht sechs Jahre vergangen. In his inaugural speech, Hitler notes something of special importance to it. The acquisition of the classical Greek statue of the discus thrower by Meron. Die beste Darstellung des Diskuswerfers, die jahrzehntelang in römischem Privatbesitz den Augen der Öffentlichkeit verborgen war, Hitler lets this event cap his speech as he says, Let us perceive how splendid man's physical beauty once was, and how we may only speak of progress when we have not only achieved such success, but even surpassed it. May we find here a measure of the tasks which confront us in our time. May we strive as one for beauty and elevation so that both our race and our art will withstand the judgment of the millennia.
It was just this correlation between man and art that elevated sculpture in the Third Reich to state art of the highest rank. Sculptors like Arno Brecker and Joseph Farak were not only artists, they were creators of a new type of man. It was their task to convey an image of the goal envisioned. To attain it, the Nazis would soon resort to more concrete measures. And it is Hitler himself who sets the process in motion. In 1938, he becomes active in a case that attracts his attention. The case of a child born blind who lacks one leg and part of an arm. Hitler orders his personal physician, Karl Brandt, to intervene. The child, whose name is Knauer, is said to be an idiot. Brandt, in Hitler's name, will tell the child's doctor to perform euthanasia, that is, to kill the child. Brandt was also to inform them that any judicial measures taken against them would be, through Hitler's fiat, null and void. Later, Brandt was told to implement euthanasia in all similar cases. Euthanasia means helping someone who is suffering to die. In the context of Nazi racial policy, the term would find a new meaning. the great German art exhibit of 1939. Hitler buys for himself 264 works. After annexing Austria, Hitler updates the plans for his home city, Linz. These dreams had occupied him since his youth. As early as 1925, he had sketched plans for a German national art gallery. In it, artists would be allotted space for their works, depending on Hitler's evaluation of their talent. These dreams now take on enormous proportions. Hitler's state visit to Italy in 1938, during which he inspects Italy's art treasures, fuels his plans even more. He envisions Linz as the world's new center of culture. Gigantic building plans are drawn up. Hitler makes one sketch after another. Dr. Hans Posse, chief of the Dresden Gallery, is recruited for a secret mission amassing the Linz art collection. His first act is to confiscate the art collections of Jews in Vienna. On September 1st, 1939, Germany attacks Poland. The Second World War has begun. Nine days before, Germany signed a non-aggression pact with the USSR. Two weeks after war's outbreak, Hitler inspects a virtually vanquished Poland. A few weeks later, Hitler orders the start of the euthanasia program. Germany is to be cleansed of its failed human specimens. Hitler's friend and personal physician, Karl Brandt, and his chief of staff, Philipp Buhler, are empowered to choose physicians for the program. 
the order is written out on Hitler's personal stationery and backdated to the day when war broke out. The tactic indicates doubts on Hitler's part. Even in the Knauer case, he had ordered that his role be kept secret. Now he hoped that the program would be more acceptable, if it could be linked with the war's outbreak. Murder of the inferiors would thus appear to be a mobilization measure. In Germany, psychiatry's ambition to preserve the body of the folk. Murder would soon be the most important form of therapy. The future laboratory for this form of therapy, the test field for extermination, was already in German hands. Poland, which had been crushed in less than a month. After extensive tests at Brandenburg Prison, Hitler, on the advice of SS doctor Werner Heyd, recommends the lethal use of carbon monoxide. An office is opened in Berlin for the program. Its address, Tiergartenstrasse 4, provides the organization's code name, T4. A system using questionnaires and doctors' reports takes form. The forms are distributed to hospitals and asylums. For each patient, details regarding pathology, work capacity, race, religion, and criminal record must be filled in. A space is reserved for the physician's decision. A blue minus sign means life. A red plus sign, death. From the beginning, Jews have a special status. For them, the diagnosis that they are Jews is enough. Later, the screened-out patients are fetched. SS personnel in white coats attend to their transport. The bus windows are painted over to prevent people from seeing in. After a temporary layover, the patients are transported to the death facility. During this time, their families receive three letters. The first one states that the patient has been moved on account of the war. Then a second letter confirms that the patient has arrived safely. A doctor has signed it with a faked signature. The last letter prepared by a special department is a letter of condolence stating a fictitious cause of death. The signature on it is faked. At the death facility, the patients are gassed in small groups. The corpses are burnt in the facility's crematorium. In the T4 program, the Nazis' medical vision had found its vehicle of practice. That the T4 doctors falsified signatures and behaved like criminals does not mean that they doubted their own convictions. No, they worried that the German people might not be ready to understand their actions. The killings could have been done by any butcher. But if medical legitimacy was to be maintained, a doctor would have to open the gas taps. As great as the energy expended now in rooting out unworthy lives is the energy devoted to the preservation of valuable Aryan blood. German medical care was among the finest in the world, with ultra-modern methods of treatment in many areas. This double role, the physician healing with one hand and killing with the other, gradually began to sow misgivings among the German people. Angesichts der unmittelbar bevorstehenden feindlichen Kriegsausweitung auf belgisches und holländisches Gebiet und der damit verbundenen Bedrohung des Ruhrgebietes ist das deutsche Westheer 
am 10. Mai bei Morgengrauen zum Angriff über die deutsche Westgrenze auf breitester Front angetreten. With the assaults on Holland and Belgium, the Western Offensive begins. In mid-June of 1940, Hitler is at his military zenith. France is vanquished. In the gray dawn of June 23rd, a plane lands at Le Bourget outside Paris. Hitler fancies an art tour and arrives with a group of artists to inspect the fallen Paris. It's six in the morning. For the first time in his life, Hitler visits the French capital. At his side, the Führer has sculptor Arno Becker and architect Albert Speer and Hermann Giesler. Their first goal is the Paris Opera. As an expert on opera houses, Hitler takes the lead. In all of Europe, there is hardly a theater of renown whose plans he has not studied, and he has carefully poured over the blueprints of the L'Opera in Paris. So well does he know the building that he finds an antechamber missing. In fact, the room had been eliminated during a renovation. Their program proceeds at a breakneck pace. The tour winds through a Paris that is not yet awake. It has been my life's dream to see Paris, Hitler says as he returns to the airport after three hours. Isn't Paris beautiful, he asks Speer, and adds, I have often deliberated whether I should have to destroy Paris, but when we're ready with Berlin, Paris will be but a shadow, so why destroy it? Now it was up to Speer to outdo Paris. The blueprints for the future capital of the world empire were now completed. In a gallery adjacent to the chancellery, Hitler has the gigantic model erected. Here is Hitler's own triumphal arch, twice as big as the one in Paris. Speer has drawn it from a sketch Hitler made in 1925. Here, the Führer's palace, a monstrous complex which will be Hitler's new residence. Here, too, is the Great Hall, the crown of the new Berlin. It is also based on one of Hitler's 1925 sketches. Now Speer would bring the dream to life. This dome was to be the largest assembly hall in the world, with seats for 180,000 people. 
Its dimensions were incomparable, 17 times as big as St. Peter's in Rome. For the entrance hall, Hitler suggests a colossal statue of himself. An opening in the roof will allow heaven's light to enter. In 1950, at the latest, with the war won, the new capital will be ready. The Great German Art Exhibit of 1940. In den Seelen des Hauses der deutschen Kunst zeigen diesmal 751 Künstler 1397 Werke der Malerei und Plastik. Hitler buys 202 canvases and sculptures. In the cultural metropolis of the future Linz, construction is underway. The half-completed Nibelungen Bridge augurs the city's new image. Now and then, Hitler pays an unexpected visit to his home city. The war has opened new possibilities for the Linz project. German occupation has unlocked the doors to Europe's treasures. Hitler's men scour occupied Europe, lugging home purchased and confiscated works to Germany. Leonardo da Vinci, Rembrandt, Jacob Jordan, from prepared catalogs, Hitler chooses works of art for transport to Germany. Deutsche Truppen in Athen. On April 6, 1941, Germany attacked Yugoslavia and Greece. On April 27th, the German army marches into the Grecian capital. To Hitler, this conquest is not just one among many. As the German troops near Athens, he forbids bombing of the city. He lays bare his feelings to Goebbels. His heart belongs to antiquity. Rome and Athens are his mecca. Hitler's mind is fixated on antiquity. Of all history's epics, antiquity alone elicited his unreserved admiration. He saw it as a model for the society he hoped to build. If we are asked about our forefathers, we must refer to the Greeks, he stated. He described Sparta as the most racially pure state in history. Ancient Rome, he said, was the most mighty republic that ever existed. Athens, Sparta, Rome, Hitler said. If we can create a synthesis of the three, our state will never perish. Auf einer Frontbreite von 2200 Kilometern vollzieht sich der größte Aufmarsch, den die Geschichte bisher gesehen hat. Die besten Soldaten der Welt sind zum Schutze der Kultur gegen die Barbarei angetreten. On June 22, Hitler attacks the Soviet Union.
But failing to crush England, he thrust Germany into a two-front war. A few weeks later, Hitler can inspect occupied Russian territory. I feel like the Robert Koch of politics, says Hitler. He discovered a microbe and broke new ground for medicine. I have exposed the Jew as the microbe that subverts society. The great German art exhibit, July 1941. For the first time, Hitler has no time to attend the opening. He has made his choices beforehand, buying 121 works. The attack on the USSR inspires Hitler to a new art initiative, an organization for war art. Artists will depict the Eastern offensive firsthand from the front. Lütpot Adam, painter and leader of the project, intended not only to paint the dreadful side of war, but the homely and poetic moments that should be made accessible to the German people. While German troops advance across Russia's vastness, Germany's largest sculptor's studio is alive with frenetic activity. Joseph Thorak is working on a sculpture in monumental format, destined for the party's rally grounds in Nuremberg. On an area of 16.5 square kilometers, an ideological landscape consisting of oak woods, travertine, and granite was to take shape. For the yearly party rallies, arenas were built to hold millions of people. In conjunction with their planning of a Zeppelin field in 1934, Speer and Hitler developed the so-called ruins principle, according to which important buildings would be constructed so that in the distant future they would collapse into picturesque ruins. Construction methods and building materials were discussed, and Speer made sketches depicting the buildings in ruins overgrown with ivy. The 360-meter-long tribune on the Zeppelin field was inspired by the altar at Pergamon. The Congress Hall was inspired by the Colosseum in Rome. On the March Field, with room for 500,000 spectators, the armed forces would demonstrate war games. Joseph Thorak's huge statue would stand above the Tribune's reviewing dais.
Along a 90-meter-wide granite street, columns of 60 men across would parade on the march field. On the site of the German stadium, excavation was in full swing. This sports arena was to contain 400,000 people and be the grandest construction of its type in history. Even before he seized power, Hitler claimed this area as historic ground. On a visit here in 1930, he declared ceremoniously, if here in the distant future archaeologists should delve the earth and strike granite beneath, let them stand bareheaded before the glorious revelation of an idea that shook the world. Hitler calculated that the Soviet Union would be beaten in four months and that the majority of Russians would side with the Germans thus hastening the Russian collapse. But he also had other objectives which were incompatible with this idea and seriously jeopardized his plans. His plans for enslavement and genocide influenced the war at an early stage. The projected eastern offensive bore all the earmarks of colonial warfare, as if the war was to be fought against some technologically benighted exotics. But one wonders if Hitler's fixation on antiquity didn't influence his strategy and his war objectives. His plans to enslave neighbors no less civilized or technologically advanced or to wipe them out, to displace vast hordes of people and reduce whole cities to ashes, transposed the war's objectives back several thousand years in time. The ghosts of ancient wars seem to haunt Hitler's modern war machine. An ultra-modern war with ancient war objectives. This pattern calls to mind antiquity's wars of annihilation, the Punic Wars, the destruction of Carthage. Victory was not enough. The goal was to invalidate the enemy's raison d'etre through annihilation of his cities and people. Here, we must revert to ancient principles. The city must be leveled with the earth, said Hitler of Leningrad. He had similar plans for Moscow, so that the Russian capital might be erased from memory. A gigantic dam would be erected on its former site. Enslaving the enemy was a classical method of acquiring manpower. The Nazis applied this method systematically to a degree unparalleled in modern times. For the projected construction work on Berlin alone, Speer requested 30,000 Russian war prisoners. The more they understood the annihilatory character of the war, the more fiercely the Russians resisted. The Russian winter arrives in November. There will not be a winter campaign, Hitler had assured his generals. The German troops are not equipped for winter.
The artists who were sent to depict the Russian offensive carry out their assignment. Their pictures bear the stamp of defeat. By early December 1941, the German offensive is halted outside Moscow. Defeat soon becomes catastrophe. Shortly afterward, the United States is drawn into the war. As 1941 fades to a close, Hitler senses that the war has reached its turning point. The proposed objectives lack material support. Hitler's vision of world dominance begins to waver. All that remains now is the Third Reich's death throes, an agony in slow motion. A secondary war objective begins to take shape, the annihilation of the Jews. At a conference in Wannsee on January 20th, 1942, the fate of European Jewry is sealed. Plans for the final solution to the Jewish question are drawn up. The German Jews had long clung to their belief in German culture. Their hope dwelt in the Germany of Goethe and Schiller. Here, they believed, was a bulwark against barbarism. In 1933, the Jews made up less than 1% of the German population. 500,000 people. By 1941, more than half of these had fled the country. The 11 million European Jews never quite sensed the coming disaster. The unthinkable was incomprehensible. The other Germany had fled into silence or exile. For a good while now, the Third Reich had been killing people to make way for the new culture. By autumn of 1941, within the T4 program, over 70,000 mental patients had been gassed but soon difficulties arose. Several of the euthanasia facilities were located near good-sized towns. The smoke from the crematoria could be plainly seen. Locks of hair wafted upward through the chimneys only to land on the streets. Drunken T4 personnel blabbered in nearby taverns. Rumors circulated about which illnesses the program dealt with. Word was that brain-damaged soldiers would share the fate of the insane. Protests from the German clergy fueled the apprehension. The fact that rumors were being spread in wartime about the liquidation of wounded soldiers was unacceptable. In August 1941, Hitler stops the more conspicuous aspects of the program. After that, the secrecy around extermination policy was tightened. Following the troops advancing eastward, special SS units, the so-called Einsatzgruppen, 
had the task of systematically shooting Jews, gypsies, and political commissars. This action was only meant as a stopgap. Eleven million Jews could hardly be disposed of in this way. The organization which Hitler trusted to carry out extermination, the SS, were the avant-garde of Nazism. It was the cream of society. Lawyers, physicians, and other educated men that SS leader Himmler recruited to its hierarchy. An ideal example of this selection is Reinhard Heydrich, a skillful fencer, an avid violinist, and one of the pioneers of the extermination policy. On July 31, 1941, Heydrich receives written orders from Goering to carry out all measures necessary to the final solution of the Jewish question. In autumn 1941, Himmler and Heydrich name SS Captain Herbert Lange to carry out the next phase of the extermination in the East. Lange had experience of execution by gas. For the euthanasia program, he had tested a new method in East Prussia, gas vans. Using three of these vehicles in Kumhof, not far from Roj, Lange will set up the first extermination camp in history. The vans serve as both gas chambers and transport trucks. The motor's exhaust is pumped into the boot. The victims are driven a short way, then dumped, and pitched directly into mass graves. The SS-2 is obliged to care for the body of the folk on two fronts. Um alle tuberkulose kranken möglichst frühzeitig zu erfassen, ist der Röntgensturmbahn der SS eingesetzt. Mit eigenen Röntgenapparaten fährt er in alle Gaue, um Reihenuntersuchungen durchzuführen. The SS doctors and X-ray buses tour ethnic German areas in Poland. Alle Volksgenossen sollen von den Röntgenschirm kommen damit jede Infektionsquelle rechtzeitig erkannt wird. While at the same time in Kumhof the gas vans shuttled to and fro, SS personnel with white coats and stethoscopes take in patients for treatment. The discovery of the Jewish microbe, Hitler says, is one of the greatest revolutions the world has known. The struggles of Pasteur and Koch must be carried on by us today. Countless diseases have but one microbe as their cause, the Jew. We shall be healthy when we have eliminated the Jews. This statement was made in February 1942. At about the same time, Christian Firth, who installed gas chambers for the T4 euthanasia program, is ordered to put his knowledge at the SS disposal. Firth considered Lange with his gas vans to be an amateur. Wirth now begins building the first stationary gas chambers in the East. On March 17th, the staff at Belzec death camp received the first victims. The gas chambers are copies of the T4 facilities with greater capacity. In quick succession, the death camps of Sobibor and Treblinka are built. In the meantime, a new method was emerging, one that would eclipse the other two completely. At Auschwitz, tests were being made with an insecticide based on cyanide. Immediately after the German invasion of Poland, a film team commissioned by Goebbels to make a propaganda film arrived in the occupied territories. The film was shot in the squalor of the Jewish ghettos. On November 28, 1940, the film opens at one of Berlin's largest cinemas. The audience consists of representatives of the party, the army, 
the arts and the sciences. Here, the campaign against the Jews reaches its zenith. This is the end of the propaganda war, the beginning of mass extermination. Immer dort, wo sich an einem Volkskörper eine Wunde zeigt, setzen sie sich fest und ziehen aus dem zerfallenen Organismus ihre Nahrung. Mit den Krankheiten der Völker machen sie ihre Geschäfte und darum sind sie bestrebt, alle Krankheitszustände zu vertiefen und zu verewigen. So ist es in Polen, so war es in Deutschland. So haben die Juden es in ihrer ganzen Geschichte gemacht. Wo Ratten auch auftauchen, tragen sie Vernichtung ins Land, zerstören sie menschliche Güter und Nahrungsmittel. Auf diese Weise verbreiten sie Krankheiten, Pest, Lepra, Typhus, Cholera, Ruhr und so weiter. Sie sind hinterlistig, feige und grausam und treten meist in großen Scharen auf. Sie stellen unter den Tieren das Element der heimtückischen, unterirdischen Zerstörung dar. Nicht anders als die Juden unter den Menschen. Am gefährlichsten aber wird das Judentum dort, wo ihm erlaubt wird, sich in die heiligsten Dinge eines Volkes, in seine Kultur, seine Religion und Kunst hineinzumischen, und darüber seine anmaßenden Urteile abzugeben. Der Schönheitsbegriff des nordischen Menschen ist dem Juden von seiner ganzen Natur aus unverständlich und wird ihm ewig unverständlich bleiben. Für die Reinheit und Sauberkeit des deutschen Kunstempfindens hat der wurzellose Jude kein Organ. Was er Kunst nennt, muss seine entarteten Nerven kitzeln. Ein Geruch von Fäulnis und Krankheit muss es umwittern. Es muss wieder natürlich, grotesk, pervers oder pathologisch sein. Diese Fieberfantasien unheilbar kranker Hirne wurden einst von jüdischen Kunsttheoretikern der deutschen Öffentlichkeit als höchste künstlerische Offenbarung aufgeredet. In 1938 another film had been made. Its theme was pest control. The film demonstrated a new, effective method using gas to kill pests. Die Anopheles-Mücke bringt die Malaria. Die Gelbfiebermücke, auch ein Todfeind des Menschen. Aber warum in die Ferne schweifen? Unsere Fliegen sind so nah. Auch sie können Krankheiten übertragen. Typhus, Cholera, Augenentzündungen. Ein etwas unbekannterer Kollege, der Messingkäfer. Aber Kleider hat er auch zum Fressen gern. Mit Metall hat dieser Messingkäfer also nichts zu tun. Dafür macht der Holzwurm seinem Namen Ehre. Er macht nicht einmal vor wertvollen Kunstschätzen Halt. In two more years, carbon monoxide will begin to be used on mental patients, and three years will pass before this gas is first used at Auschwitz. The gas is called Zyklin B. Blausäure, die ja äußerst giftig ist, eignet sich zur Schädlingsbekämpfung ganz besonders. Hier ihre einfachste Anwendungsart. Man lässt sie von porösen Gipswürfeln aufsaugen, die dann in gewöhnlichen Blechbüchsen gasdicht verschlossen werden. Mit Blausäure durchgast man größte Betriebe ohne jede Gefahr für Mensch und Material. Die Fenster werden gasdicht verklebt. 
In April 1943, Himmler gives a private speech before some SS officers. Anti-Semitism is like being de-loused. Getting rid of lice is hardly a philosophical issue. It's a matter of cleanliness. Similarly, anti-Semitism is a hygienic measure that we have been forced to endure. We shall soon be de-loused. There are only 20,000 lice left. They will soon be extinct in all of Germany. Gas! Gas! It was not by pure chance that an insecticide would be the Nazis' most effective weapon in the fight against the Jews. For years now, propaganda had hammered out the metaphor. The Jews as bacteria, insects, vermin. Therefore, to Auschwitz Commandant Rudolf Huss and his personnel, it cannot have been far-fetched that the stuff used to kill the camp's pests could also be used on people. For Huss, it was also a matter of delicacy. I was always appalled at the idea of shootings, he tells. Therefore, I was relieved to think that we might be spared all these blood baths, and that even the victims would be spared suffering until the end. 20 Stunden lang Blausäureeinwirkung und alle Schädlinge mit Brut und Larven sind vernichtet. Hier in diesen hellen gepflegten Räumen gibt es keine Schädlinge. Sauberkeit und Erhaltung der wertvollen Güter bilden die Grundlagen für die Gesundheit und den Wohlstand eines Volkes. The Nazi cult of beauty functioned as a mental cosmetic. The picture of the ideal was the screen, behind which the murderers could pursue their craft. When Auschwitz Commandant Huss describes the ideal he created for his wife and children in the death camp's shadow, it is a clear expression of this function. After mass killings began, I was no longer happy at Auschwitz, he laments. My wife could not fathom my gloomy moods. She ascribed it all to my job. After it became clear to her what I did, we seldom felt the desire for sexual intercourse. From 1942 on, the gas chamber was the foremost tool of extermination. The mass shootings had ceased. Murder took on the guise of a hygienic measure. At Auschwitz, the medical aura was kept intact. Physicians played a major role in the killing process. It was they who selected the victims and saw to it that the poison gas Zyklon B was used as prescribed. Afterward, it was they who checked to see if the victims were really dead. A system which forced the victims to operate the killing facilities would spare the killers the unpleasantness of their horrible trade. Mass murder was the ultimate consequence of Hitler's ambition to create the new man. The cosmetic of the Nazi beauty cult finally found its way into the gas chamber. The killing was a biological mission, a holy tribute to pure blood. The death factories were anthropological sanitation facilities, instruments to beautify the world.
I have ordered every officer to carry, besides his sword, Karl Mai's books on how to fight Indians. That is how they must fight the Russians. They must hide behind trees and bridges. Then leap forth for the kill. This statement by Hitler from 1942 betrays his bizarre relation to reality. Karl May was Hitler's favorite author. This German author wrote some 70 boys' books that Hitler had read as a child. Karl May wrote books about Indians and romantic adventure tales set in exotic surroundings. Richness of style and detail and a realism that evokes travel books are characteristic of his work. Descriptions of the Indians' fire-making techniques, details on weapons, clothing, and provisions. Karl May had never visited the places he wrote about, nor had he ever come in contact with foreign peoples or influences. He shared this lack of real experience with the untraveled Hitler. Even as an adult, Hitler continued to read Karl May's books. During the war, he could cite Karl May as proof that it wasn't necessary to know the desert to command troops in Africa. Hitler was well aware of Mai's lack of experience. He did not regard Mai as a garrulous adventurer, though, but rather, in all seriousness, as a fount of wisdom. He saw in Karl May a kind of armchair visionary with a clairvoyance access to distant realities. On another occasion, Hitler names May as an example of how someone with imagination and the power of insight does not need to know a certain people, even as May did not know Bedouins or Indians to know their souls better than any anthropologist who had studied them. To Hitler, Karl May was proof that one needn't travel to know the world. Hitler explicitly held the view that imagination could provide the basis for knowledge. Thus he was betrayed by his inability to distance himself from the visions that crowded in on him. This lack of critical distance was particularly obvious in one area where Hitler's experience was scanty. His assessment of unfamiliar peoples. This is typified by his attitude toward the Jews. Anti-Semitism's classical document, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a fake document, which purports to verify a Jewish conspiracy to rule the world, struck Hitler like a revelation while the question of its authenticity paled by comparison. The grip these ideas had on Hitler is evident in his paradoxical strategies. The more futile the war against the Allies became, the more zealously annihilation of the Jews was pursued. Despite the constant dearth of vital equipment and transportation, extermination of the Jews had the highest priority. To understand the seeming lack of logic, one must reflect over the nature of Hitler's anti-Semitism. He saw the Jew as a subhuman, a cancer spreading itself over the world. But because the Jew had preserved his own racial purity, he was the Aryan's fiercest rival for world domination. In Hitler's imagination, a fight to the death was raging against the strongest and most dangerous of enemies. To wage war without fighting this primary enemy was unthinkable for Hitler. The more casualties the war reaped, 
the more important extermination of the Jews became. To Hitler, losing the war would not mean the end of Nazism. A grandiose German fall would provide inspiration to coming generations. Extermination of the Jews would enable the temporarily weakened German nation to raise itself once more from the ruins. On the night of May 30th and 31st, 1942, thousands of British bombers expel their payloads over Cologne. For the first time, the Allies strike a deadly blow to Germany's heart. The destruction is horrible. The attack is a harbinger of the firestorms that will now plague Germany. Stalingrad, January 31st, 1943. The 6th German Army has been surrounded and destroyed. 90,000 Germans are taken prisoner. And now the whole world knows that Germany is losing the war. Konzert in einem Panzerkampfwagenwerk. In der Arbeitspause spielt das Orchester des Deutschen Opernhauses unter der Stabführung von Hans Schmidt Isserstedt. The Soviet armies are now advancing all along the front. As the German troops retreat, the SS are given still another mission. Himmler has ordered that every trace of the mass murders be eradicated. The job is to be carried out by a special unit, Sonderkommando 1005. Even as the German war machine slowly falls to pieces, Sonderkommando 1005 is occupied with the cosmetic adjustment of history. Before the Russian onslaught, the mass graves must be opened, the corpses burned, and the skeletons ground to dust in bone mills. Weeds will be sown to hide the grave sites. The Great German Art Exhibit, 1943. Trotz der Stürme des Krieges kann die Kunst in diesem gigantischen Schicksalskampf ihrer Aufgabe dienen. Hier einige der ausgestellten Werke. Nacht, ein Gemälde von Willy Kriegel. Morgenröte, eine Brunnengruppe von dem jungen Berliner Bildhauer Robert Ullmann. Hitler buys 48 paintings and sculptures. Hitler's plans for the Linz museums are still proceeding apace. 
Architect Hermann Giesler works nonstop on the blueprints and models. The hunt for Europe's art treasures continues. Between 1942 and 43, Hitler's men acquire some 3,000 more works. Vermeer, Rubens, Vicelli, Amigoni. Each work is carefully cataloged. In war-torn Germany, an evacuation is planned. The art treasures will be stored in a salt mine in the Austrian Alps. Normandy, June 6, 1944. The Allied invasion has begun. Paris, August 20th. The Allies approach Paris. The Germans are preparing to pull out of the city. The French resistance are already fighting them in the Paris streets. Over four years have passed since Hitler visited Paris as her conqueror. Now his thoughts return there. On August 23rd, he orders defense of the city. If this fails, Paris is to be leveled with the earth. Two days later, Paris is liberated. The German armies are now in retreat on every front. Hitler orders the scorched earth policy. The Allies have penetrated Germany's national borders. Now the war will be fought on German soil as well. Wohnstätten und Kulturdenkmäler sanken in Trümmer. Versorgungs- und Verkehrswege wurden unterbrochen, aber das Leben geht unter der Erde weiter. In riesigen unterirdischen Küchen ist die Verpflegung der Bevölkerung gewährleistet. Archive und Sachwerte wurden den Zerstörungen nicht erreichbar in Sicherheit gebracht. Die Verwaltung der Stadt hat sich der Forderung des Tages entsprechend angepasst. Hier gibt es kein Vorzimmer mehr. Hitler prepares his retreat to a bunker beneath the Chancellery in Berlin. Auschwitz, January 27, 1945. Russian troops have reached the death camp. On February 9th, Hermann Giesler delivers to Hitler's bunker the final model of Linz's recreation. For hours on end, Hitler studies the doomed plans. All that remains now of the Linz project is an attempt which fails to destroy the planned museum's art treasures. In the salt mine in the Austrian Alps, where most of the works are stored, explosives are planted, which at the approach of the enemy troops should blow the entire depot sky high. Rapidly now, the Allied armies approach Germany's core. On March 1st, Hitler orders the press to publish articles on the Punic Wars. The German struggles to be likened to Rome's wars against Carthage. 
It took three long wars to secure Rome's place in the ancient world. Despite his physical and mental decline, Hitler keeps his grip on those around him. The impending catastrophe seems to arouse new vigor in him. The shame of defeat will be offset by the glory of Germany's fall. Out of total defeat, new grain will sprout forth, he declares. On March 19th, Hitler orders targeted areas emptied of population at once. And all supply depots and objects of real value destroyed. If the war is lost, the German people are also lost, Hitler maintains. It isn't necessary to be concerned about what the Germans will need for elementary survival. After this struggle, only the inferior will be left. The good will have perished. The Germans, Hitler's chosen people, had left him in the lurch. Now they would meet their doom. The Soviet troops have reached Berlin. I will be true, though all have me forsaken. I'll bear my banner even to defeat. Upon my tongue a madman's words awaken, yet if I fall this banner will be taken to be in death my glorious winding sheet. Already in 1933, Baldur von Schirach had penned this verse, based on Hitler's own words. As if this drama's final scene was most important, they had begun at the end. Hitler saw doom as art's highest form of expression. Each time that he and Beirut had seen Wagner's Gotterdammerung with its fiery collapse at the end, he would reach for Winifred Wagner's hand in the darkness of the box and kiss it with devotion. The drama had now become reality for Hitler. Its completion was his final and decisive theatrical mission. After defeat, there is nothing. With Hitler's death, the Nazi movement collapses. There are no slogans urging on the fight, no nests of resistance. Overnight, Nazism has completely lost its momentum. Far from Germany, in the cellars of the victors, portraits of the Nazi hierarchy come to light decades later. Alongside Gauleiter and party functionaries, we find doctors, genocide experts, and architects. Defining Nazism in traditional political terms is difficult, mainly because its dynamic was fueled by something quite different from what we usually call politics. This driving force was, to a great degree, aesthetic. Its ambition was to beautify the world through violence. From the first murders of mental patients to the mass murders of Jews, there is no real political motive. It was not enemies who were liquidated, nor opponents of the regime, but innocent people whose very existence was in conflict with the Nazi dream.
The civilian character of the mass killing makes it unlike war crimes. These were civilian murders under a military guise. The obscure mental baggage, the bizarre political notions, which constitute a kind of under-vegetation in European culture, suddenly saw the light of day with Hitler. Hitler went from words to deeds. Without restraint, he transformed an absurd ideology into a hellish reality. Mm -hmm. 